Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Caitlin O'Connor, and I am the Education and Outreach Specialist at Prairie Moon Nursery. And we are a native plant nursery that offers over 700 different types of North American native plants for woodlands, wetlands, savannas, and of course, prairies. And I'm happy to be here. All right, Sarah, if you want to go next. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Fultz Jordan. I'm a pollinator conservation biologist with the Xerces Society. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar, Xerces is a nonprofit conservation group. Karen and I both work for Xerces, so she might say a little bit more about our organization. Um, but we're working nationwide. Our pollinator team is, uh, I want to say primarily, maybe just mostly my work and Karen's work is primarily focused on working with farmers like Joan and um, we do a lot of habitat installation work. We'll say more about that later. But yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, Karen, if you want to go next. Sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my name's Karen Jokola. And like Sarah, I work for the Xerces Society. Uh, one of my role is a little bit unique within Xerces. I have a, there's a few of us who are in this cohort of of partner biologists. We are uh, essentially contract biologists for the USDA NRCS, the Natural Resources Conservation Service. So that means um, most of the work we do is in service of farmers and the natural resource, uh, <laughs> the NRCS conservation planners who work with farmers and who offer technical and financial assistance through the farm bill. So um, navigate those farm bill programs, figure out which ones are really useful for them or which ones they might want to try to, um, anyway, anyway, lots of different ways for me to help tap in with farmers. I also do a lot of training for NRCS staff, um, helping them get up to speed on best practices for pollinators and how to install habitat. And you're a farmer too, right? That too, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, my husband and I, I, I feel a little imposter syndrome calling myself a farmer because I work full-time off the farm, but I, I live here. I see a lot of what's happening. I implement a lot of the practices that we talk about on our farm. It's sort of an experimental playground for me to see what works and what doesn't. So yeah, I have a lot of practical experience right here in my backyard too. All right, thank you. And Joan Olson. Uh, my name is Joan Olson, and my husband and I own and operate Prairie Drifter Farm, which is a 33 acre diversified vegetable farm in Litchfield, Minnesota, west of the Twin Cities. Um, and I've been working for several years now with Sarah. Um, I learned about pollinator management actually at Moses at a Moses conference and was inspired by one of the talks that I saw there and got connected to our local NRCS office to try to get an equip grant for our farm and um, got connected to Sarah. And since then we've done a lot of installations in our farm and have done several, um, worked on several grants with Sarah to do demonstration plots in our farm. And I've learned so much over the years and um, I'm really grateful to be on with these folks because this has been really impactful for our farm um, moving forward. So just excited to share what's worked and what hasn't worked for our farm. Yeah, to just get us started. So if if someone is just starting out with trying to establish pollinator habitat, what's what should they what should they do? What are their first steps? Should they call up NRCS? Should they call up Xerxes? Should they just get some seeds in the ground? <laughs> I'll answer first, and I would love to hear what other people think. Uh, I'm completely biased here, but I would suggest uh, starting with Xerces. Um, I think if you're, if pollinator habitat is your goal, then we probably have a better perspective on how to plan for that appropriately. A lot of NRCS staff are kind of jacks of all trades. They, they have so much knowledge and training on um, soil science and engineering and lots of different things, but um, but we are the, the posts. And so if that's really your goal, then I would start with Xerces. And then of course, part of my role is to help get you connected to NRCS. 
and get that uh, local staff person involved in the planning process. Um, and it really depends on your region. Some NRCS planners are really um, skilled botanists and they're, they're very experienced pollinator planners. Um, but I've also run into situations where um, I've come into the process after the fact where NRCS has already planned a bunch of habitat. And um, I would say a lot of NRCS planners don't have a lot of experience working with organic farmers. And so I think they sometimes don't quite understand what's involved in organic site prep and that kind of thing. So when I've come into the process after the fact, we've had to rearrange the whole planning process because we really need to do more aggressive organic site prep or things like that. So um, I would say just contacting both of us <laughs> to get us all on the same page would be maybe the first step. Yeah, and just to, to add to what Karen said, um, I think, you know, there, the NRCS is a really great resource available, um, but there could be other resources available to you as well. And you might also consider stopping by your local soil and water conservation district, because there very well could be county or state based programs um, or other programs through other um, federal organizations like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Program. And so I think it really can help um, to go out and get a nice picture about what are the resources that are available to you for cost share so that you can, you can make those dollars on your project go as far as you can. Um, and oftentimes the soil and water conservation districts are a great place to kind of synthesize all of those programs that are available in any given location. Um. As a farmer, I wanted to echo everything that was said. And then also we have this like awesome, um, our, our FSA office is also housing our NRCS office and our soil and water conservation district and our neighbors are the US Fish and Wildlife Service. And I just wanna echo that they all had different things to bring to the table um, about where, where to start and what options were and what the cost share programs were. But I think I would echo what Karen said, and that going to Xerxes first can kind of kind of get you steered into a, a direction. And then like bringing all those partners in to, to beef everything up is really helpful. I think what we found when we went to our local NRCS office, this is a, some time ago when this was not terribly common. I'm Sarah, if I can recall, like when we first started, there just wasn't a lot of that going on around here. And so there wasn't a, no, a great knowledge base in the NRCS office. What there was though, was a lot of interest and passion for NRCS office and them working together with Xerxes and then it being just a really awesome partnership. So I think I echo like making that a connect with Xerxes because they do have the branches to go out to these or other organizations and then just bring all your partners in that you can because it can only make it stronger of what's happening in your farm. So to have somebody from Xerxes come out, I just call, is there like a local branch or do I just go onto the website and I, I look up, look for a number on there? I would just start by emailing Karen or I. Um, you can go to the main website as well, and they would redirect to one of us if you're if you're in Minnesota, Wisconsin, or Iowa. Um, and yeah, we I mean we might not necessarily be able to get out on the farm with you right away. Um, if your farm is far away, um, well now with COVID things are a little different too. But often we'll try to get a number of farmers together that we can visit in one trip. Um, and get out there with you. But in the meantime, we can always get on the phone and answer questions and help just help you get started on that planning process. And like Karen said, often it's connecting you with NRCS and NRCS programs. Cool. Thank you. Oh, yeah. And Karen just added her contact info to the chat. So you've got that. And I'm based up in Duluth, so more northern, northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin at the moment. And so you meet, you'll meet somewhere in the middle? <laughs> like we're on the I-94 corridor, <laughs> kind of right between you guys. <laughs> yeah. It can be yeah. Able to, to contact both of us and then Sarah and I can discuss and maybe we're all involved in the project, but one person does a site visit or... Um, I have funds to travel, um, and so I can travel, may take a full day to go out and back, but um, I can do that. Okay. 
and is a there lot a person accomplished virtually too we can do a lot um over the phone or looking at virtual maps and that kind of thing so um yeah is there a preferred time of year you like to come out like when things are growing so you can actually see everything there is that the preference or does it not matter that's preferred yeah definitely yeah. Karen can probably do a better job identifying obscure seed heads and <laughs> figuring things out. But, um, but yeah, the growing season is easiest for mostly for assessing weed pressure and kind of what you've got going on um, in terms of your native plant diversity too. I think that's true, Stephanie. I think it also depends on kind of what you want us to look at. So um, it would be especially important if you wanted to us wanted me to, or Sarah to assess like woodlands where there's maybe a lot of ephemeral species that would be hidden in the winter. They wouldn't even have seed heads necessarily. Um, so that would be really critical. But yeah, I think a big one is just assessing weed pressure on the farm. So that's really best to see when the weed pressure is showing its <laughs> its most pressure. <laughs> I don't know. Um, to be able to look at pollinators with you and oh for sure yeah your bumblebees and learning them and that sort of thing okay that's pretty awesome i've actually worked a lot with the nrcs um i implemented a rotational grazing plan with them and then i'm next spring we this is like a four generation farm that it was a conventional dairy that you know kind of got beat up a little bit. So I'm trying to regenerate it. And I want to make sure that I'm installing these systems, you know, these make, making sure that these habitats are included in the overall plan, but I don't know the first thing about it. So um, thank you, you guys, <laughs> for your work. I might, uh, if nobody else wants to jump in real quick, I might highlight um, and maybe we can add a, I'll put a link into the chat to one of the tools that I use when I'm planning with farmers is um, what we call a habitat assessment guide. And it's something that a farmer can use themselves to, to sort of self assess what exists on the farm already and then where you might, it kind of quantifies what's already there and what's absent. And that helps you kind of pull apart um, the habitat features that are there and that are already working for you. And then when I, then you can find your deficiencies and kind of build habitat to fill in those deficiencies. So you're, you're doing the, the planning a little bit more strategically and you're not just um, kind of just opportunistically throwing in flowers wherever, you know, you're, you're thinking thoughtfully about all the different habitat needs and that kind of thing. So, um, Stephanie, I might suggest starting with that because you know your land pretty well. Um, so yeah, I'll look that up and send, put a little link in the chat. On this topic of more holistic farm planning, um, another opportunity that's available to farmers is something called a pollinator conservation activity plan. And that's funded through the NRCS. It comes at typically comes at no cost to the farmer, um, but it would be an, a way to enable you to essentially hire a, a TSP like Xerces, a technical service provider like, like the Xerces Society to come out on your farm and do more rigorous planning. Um, Joan went through that process, so maybe you could say a little bit more about that. I don't think it's necessary for everyone, um, but it can be a really good way to step back take things slow. Um, you know, we often write these plans as sort of a five-year, 10-year plan. So you're going to bite off different pieces of it year by year. Um, and we also include elements like an inventory of the species, the native species, and the weedy species that you already have on your farm, or strategies to manage your invasive species, um, lists of, of your insect pollinators if we're able to do some, some quick surveys. Uh, other fun, just kind of fun things like that that might be exciting. But yeah, I'll let Joan say more about that. Yeah, so that was actually what we learned about first at the Moses conference was that, oh, you could have this plan written for your farm. And so that's when we contacted our NRCS office and they hadn't really heard about it. So we ended up talking to Xerxes and NRCS at the same time. 
Um, our local office hadn't heard of it, I should say, because it, it's a really small little thing and a really large program that NRCS operates. Um, and it was really helpful. So um, we wrote a grant like Sarah, or it was this eco grant, like Sarah said, and paid for everything. We had no cost um, for us to have Sarah come out and write the plan. So Sarah spent several hours at our farm. We literally walked around the farm and walked at every, looked at everything. We had overhead maps of our farm. And when we came away with that plan, it was, I think ours was like a three to four year plan. And we just took different sections of our farm that we could attack at different times and think about like, what, what's the low hanging fruit? What do we already have? Let's map what we already have, um, what's already going well. And then it just felt really manageable and doable because it wasn't all at once. It was like, oh, okay, this year we're gonna look at this area and next year we're gonna look at this area. This is where we can um, try to write some equip funding to try to get some of this paid for on a cost share in terms of seeds or plants. Um, it was just a really great, I, I like to do the overall step back overview because it makes it seem more manageable. And now we have this great overhead map of our farm just showing where, where things are located and what's working, what's not. Um, it was just a really wonderful way to also connect with NRCS and not just have the plan written, but then be able to plug into NRCS and get particular cost shares for specific practices then we can move forward with. So it was really helpful, um, really helpful, and especially to have Sarah on the farm and, and seeing what we had and seeing what we could do. And a very easy process, I will say, on the farmer's end. I know there's a lot of paperwork on Xerxes and NRCS's end, but for the farmer, it was great. <laughs> and it looks like Karen just posted the link for that too in the chat. Um, I have a question for Joan. So in your, so to catch everyone up there, Sarah and Joan had a talk at the 2020 Moses conference about pollinator habitat. And that was the third episode in the series. Um, and I think Joan, you mentioned um, that climate change has, has been affecting your farm and the water tables rising. And I th thought maybe you could talk a bit more about um, like how that affects your pollinator habitat and then maybe how your pollinate, pollinator habitat um, helps to mitigate some of the effects of climate change? Yeah, I'd say I'm um, thinking about climate change. I, I wouldn't say that on our farm the climate change is affecting our pollinator habitat, but I would say that our pollinator habitat has really helped with um, water on our farm. So our farm is fairly wet, we're sitting fairly low, and the water table rising is several things. One, big rain events, but then also um, we are sort of a catch-all farm for a lot of farms that have drainage, um, drain tile around us, and we sort of get it all. And then we have a waterway that runs through our farm that actually spills into U.S. Fish and Wildlife land. And be, um, because this waterway was at one time dredged um, commonly, the water used to flow more, but now downstream of us, it's no longer dredged. And it's, it's um, it, the water doesn't flow through like it once did. So we have planted all of the area around that waterway into, um, I wouldn't say prairie per se, but like um, grasses and forbs, and it really helps with the water, water management on our farm. Those, <laughs> those plants take up so much water and it really helps with rain events. And then we've tried then to do strips around our farm that are not disturbed that, that um, around edges of our production fields and those perennial strips of flowers and grasses have been also really helpful when it comes to erosion. So again, I wouldn't say that our pollinator habitat is affected by, by climate change, but I'd say it's been a great boon for our farm in terms of just like doing intentional plantings that are, are not bare ground and they're meant to be a cover um, year round. So I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but I'd say just it's a win-win <laughs> having that habitat on the farm. Can I ask Joan a question as a follow-up? Um, given what you have observed about your pollinator habitat or your, your habitat installation helping with some of, helping mitigate some of that water um, runoff, uh, does it encourage you to think about adding more habitat in, in certain strategic oh. areas? Definitely. I think, um, and maybe we'll talk about this later, but I think any kind of, in addition to installing habitat is um, time, even more so than cost, to be perfectly honest, time of just getting something started. Um, 
but no, gosh, I would love to have more in our farm if, if we could. And part of that too, which I learned from Sarah is it's not only just installing habitat, it's also the practices that you're currently using, like with cover crops. You know, when do you, when do you take the cover crop down? How long do you let it stand? All, all those things are also part of managing um, for pollinators as well. So yeah, I, I would love to do more, I think, with, as with anything with farming, we all know when you're farming, there's just so much to do during the growing season. And if only you can install a habitat in the winter, <laughs> that'd be amazing. Um, but no, I'm definitely encouraged to do to do more because I just only see benefits in our farm. And it's just, it's economic, it's, um, it's you know, insects, it's pollinators, it's beauty, um, it's fun. Like there's just so many benefits to, to installing habitat. It kind of, it's endless really, um, the, the good that that brings to our farm. Yeah, Ben put in the chat, winter prairie overseeding is, is uh, are there many options for like frost seeding and things like that that are, that you could establish things with? Yeah, I can I can jump in here, um, and I will say that you know fall and winter are when professionals, uh, professional restorationists, do the vast majority of their planting. Um, but now, of course, I feel like sometimes seeding can be the part, um, and that site preparation is really where um, you're doing the majority of the labor, uh, especially on on the front end there. And that site preparation step is so crucial; cannot be overstated how crucial site preparation is to the ultimate success of, of the project of any habitat installation. Um, but yes, the seeding part of it is often done in off season. Um, and so the reason that that is usually done is because a lot of our native uh, wildflowers especially require overwintering or they call it a stratification period. And that will break the dormancy mechanism on the seed and allow germination to to happen in the springtime, um, but I will say that you know the NRCS is off is often working on timelines, and other cost share programs are working on timelines that may or may not be aligned um, with those with those types of timelines seeding in the fall or seeding in the winter. So we do still see lots of projects that get installed in in the springtime, and some even in the summertime. And for most projects, you know, five years down the line, you can't really tell the difference, you know, when it was seeded. But those first few years in your restoration project, um, you know, you will be able to tell uh, if the if the wildflowers are kind of a year behind the grasses. Um, so so yeah, there is some work that can be done with the installation throughout the winter time. Caitlin, I just made a chime in. I wanted to, Ben, thank you for your comment about winter prairie overseeding. We've definitely done that on our farm. And I appreciate, Caitlin, what you said about the site prep is so much of the time. And I think that's where I, when I think about time as a farmer, is the site prep time for us as annual vegetable growers oftentimes overlaps with our busy time. And I think, again, this is the benefit for farmers to hook up with people who do this for a living because it's a long game. And as an annual vegetable producer, you think of like, this year, I'm gonna seed it in the spring. And done. And it's just not how it works with perennial installations. And I think having partners that understand farmers really well and understand your busy seasons and then understand the process it takes and, and the reality check about how many years it's gonna to take to really do this well and not to speed through it, but take your time with that site prep. Um, so again, it's just like the benefit of working with as many partners as possible. So Caitlin, thank you for mentioning that because I think the site prep can be really overwhelming when you don't know how, but luckily we have all these amazing professionals who do know how and, and can work with your farming operation. Yeah, to follow up on that, um, what are some of the pros and cons of, of like trying to get perennials established versus thinking through more of your annual um, pollinator habitat and flowering species and things like that. Yeah, I, this is something I've been interested in for a while because um, I don't know, we do a lot of both. We do a lot of annual flowering plantings on farms and a lot of native perennial plantings on farms. And there's pros and cons, I think, to, to, to both options. Um, the annual plantings are typically non-native kind of cover crop type, type plants. So things like buckwheat, clovers, 
um, even like zinnia, like cut flowers, so zinnias or sunflowers, um, multi-purpose plantings, you might be able to use them as a saleable crop, um, but also they're blooming and providing a lot of forage for your pollinators. I also think they're fun because if, if a farmer is totally new to, to pollinator habitat and to having flowers on their farm at all, it's sort of a wake up call. Like you plant flowers and insects come, even, even with just these annuals. Um, the drawback, the main drawback that I see to these annual plantings is that they don't do enough. So our native insects have co-evolved for millennia native plants. Um, and there's a lot of insects that are strictly dependent on native plants, particularly when you think about the leaf tissue. So um, I don't think I did a very good job explaining this on the, on the, at the presentation at Moses, so I'm gonna try to do a better job here, but um, a lot of our, of our butterflies and moths, they can nectar on any flower. Um, some are more attractive than others, but they can really use nectar from a wide variety of, of plants, native and non-native. But when it comes to the caterpillars feeding on leaf tissue, they often have very, very specific preferences. So monarchs, monarch caterpillars feeding on milkweed plant tissue is a perfect example that people are really familiar with, but that rings true for most butterflies and moths. Uh, so if you really want to support those larval stages of your Lepidoptera, having native plantings is key. Um, and also, I mean, we talk about bees and butterflies and these pollinators that we all love to see, but there's so many other really critical herbivorous insects that feed on plant tissue that support higher trophic levels. Um, so yeah, native is best for all of those, for all of those organisms. And I think, yeah, I guess another, another thing that would point me towards the annual habitat, a situation where annual habitat might be more appropriate would be when you've got land that's not in production for a given growing season, um, and so you wanna throw something down, but you're not ready to commit that acreage to permanent perennial habitat indefinitely. Um, so that would be a perfect situation for throwing buckwheat down or sunflowers or something to just, you know, create some resources on your farm at that, for that given season or, or portion of a season. But native perennial is where it's at. I just threw in a, um, a link in the chat box, uh, which is a really good fact sheet about what kinds of cover crops farmers typically use and what their value is to native pollinators, um, beneficial insects, and even like, I think honeybees is another column in the one of the tables. So it's a really a great resource that I often find myself handing out to farmers. So, one thing, the, the first time I heard of beetle banks, I was just like blown away and like really excited by it because I heard someone say that some, that they eat like a large number of weed seeds every year or something like that. Um, and I think both uh, Joan and Karen mentioned beetle banks. So uh, I was wondering if you want to just share a little bit more about them, like uh, what they are, what kind of role they play, if there's any cost share programs to support establishing them. I can start if you want, Joan. Um, I, Xerces has been working on beetle banks actually for a number of years now, and um, we've written about it in some of our publications, and we're in the midst of doing some trials in the Midwest, especially in Iowa, which Sarah could talk about. Um, but the, the general idea is that um, on farms where people are growing annual crops, um, that tillage that's required to grow your annual crop is really destroying a lot of habitat that beneficial insects need. And on organic farms where um, growers are trying to not use pesticides, um, it it's really wise to bring in some permanent habitat right next to your the crops that you're growing so that there's refuge for those those animals that can um, can be available when you have a pest outbreak. These beneficial insects like predatory beetles that eat both weed seeds and um, crop pests can be readily available to just go right into your into your crop field. 
Um, and then they have overwintering habitat. They can kind of grow and thrive there. So you have these little set aside areas um, kind of throughout your annual cropping system to maintain some of those beneficial insects. Um, and the cool thing is that you can throw in some wildflowers too and support a bunch of pollinators at the same time. They, they typically um, are promoted as being these um, grassy habitats where you're featuring a lot of bunch grasses that have kind of that, that litter structure that allows for some like overwintering habitat under there. Um, but you can, I have found on our farm, very good results uh, by incorporating both flowers and bunch grasses. Um, you still get a lot of these same types of insects that show up. Um, yeah, and, and Sarah might be able to say a little bit more about kind of the bigger, I don't know, she's been more involved in some of the Midwest trials and I know she's helped install them like on Joan's farm, so. Yeah, I just posted a link in the chat um, to an article that we wrote just a few months ago for the Moses Broadcaster on beetle banks. So it has a little bit more detail on kind of big picture why, why, how these things perform, what, how they matter, why they matter ecologically, but then also a little bit of the step-by-step -step installation information. But I was just peeking at that article again because we had a, a little bit of information in there from a researcher in Iowa that we've been partnering with, Dr. Kirk Larson, and he's a, he's a ground beetle expert um, who has been doing monitoring of some of our strips. And we don't have all of his data back yet, but just his initial one year of, of monitoring, he found over 1,400 individual ground beetles in these strips, representing 43 different species with an average of 26 different species per farm. Just looking at this one type of, of carabid ground beetle, so the ones, I think the ones that you were thinking of, Chuck, that are known for being not only um, ferocious predators of crop pests, but they also eat weed seeds. So they have kind of an omnivorous diet and they're, they're nocturnal, so they're not often seen. I usually see them only if I'm out digging in the soil and under mulch. Um, and you see, they're so fast, they, they get out of the light so quickly. Um, so just another one of those kind of unsung heroes on the farm. Um, Joan might want to talk a little bit about process of installation or because we've done some different things on your farm. Well, before we move on, I just want to jump in real quick too. If folks are uh, interested in learning more about this topic, um, the Xerxes Society has an awesome book called Farming with Native Beneficial Insects. And Prairie Moon has done a seed mix design that was based off of that book that I threw up um, in, in the links. So if you are a farmer who is interested in practicing integrated pest management, this mix might be something that you would consider and we call it the Insectopia um, seed mix. So I just wanted to throw those few resources out there. Thanks, Caitlin. Yeah, thank you, Caitlin. Um, so Sarah asked about what we had done. And so Sarah helped us install a couple of these strips in our farm. And so we are an annual vegetable farm. So a couple of um, things that we have the ability to do are one, grow things out in a greenhouse because we already have that skill set and those tools. And then um, two, we were able to transplant them just like we transplant our annual vegetable crops. So our insect strips are located right on the very edge of our production fields. We just chose a couple that seemed like good spots for us where they were kind of spread across the farm. And then on Sarah's suggestion, we did incorporate grasses and forbs. And we try to do a, a wide range of bloom times in the forb, we have early bloomers, mid bloomers, and late bloomers. And then within those are the bunch grasses that um, Karen was talking about. And we did get some bunch grass plugs. Um, and I think they came from Prairie Moon, right, Sarah? In our planting, um, I think plugs came from MNL. Um, <laughs> the, insect, in the Insectopia seed mix we used on one strip, so that was from Prairie Moon. That's right. Okay, so then we, um, so we just like literally had grown out a few plugs in our greenhouse. We had just like flats of seventy-two plugs, and then we had several plugs we gotten from Sarah because this is part of a demonstration grant on our farm, and we hopped on the tractor, put all the plugs on, did kind of a a mishmash um, kind of chaotic planting it was actually great to plant where it wasn't so specific like our vegetables and it was like grasses for some here some there a mixed species and then we um, 
cultivated that our first year, just like we would have cultivated a broccoli um, bed and we irrigated it right along with our crop. And it was amazing how fast it took off. It was, it grew so fast. It, different than when you overseed things that are growing from seed, uh, like we talked about overwintering where they have to stratify. It's just boom, really quick, really quick results. And then the next spring we did um, cultivate them once in the early spring just to have them get a little heads up on the annual weeds. And now really it's filled in so well. Some of the, the seed heads from the Forbes have dropped seeds and then they kind of spread. But um, we were a little bit worried about with that strip kind of infringing on our planting area and starting to creep, but it really hasn't because we are on an annual basis disrupting the field right next to it. We haven't had troubles with creep. We haven't had weed issues. Um, it's really, it's just really a neat process and it didn't really take much work beyond what we are already doing, it was really easy to, in, to incorporate into an annual vegetable setting. Um, and the really neat thing is we, I, I think, I don't know, Sarah, Carrie, if you wanna talk about this, but um, when you're choosing the species, you chose more species than were maybe necessarily realistic because we weren't exactly sure what was gonna do great on that spot. So we had a, a lot of species. And what we found is we planted the same exact plants in two spots on two different soil types. And some have dominated on one soil type and, dom and some have dominated differently on the other soil type. So your strips kind of like even themselves out after a while. And every year they're changing and every year they're getting bushier when it comes to the perennials. And um, we will go through and kind of do some hand pulling and weeding occasionally. And then Nick will mow it high. And Sarah, I don't know if you wanna talk about this, but um, when we mow it, you mow it high to keep the stems available as well for insects. So I'd love it if you talk a bit about that and kind of the post management, but in general, I'd say it worked really well right alongside our annual vegetable setup. Sure. Yeah. As far as, I guess there's a few things there that you touched on. What maybe, maybe just to kind of wrap up the seed versus slug conversation. Um, we did both on Jones farm. We've done both on many farms. Um, and I think takeaways there are seed is tends to be less costly um, both in terms of time seeding and in terms of the cost of the actual plant material um, but if you're an organic vegetable farmer and you know like Joan you can really bring down the cost of your plug planting by growing a lot of those out yourself so in Joan's case you took on I don't know how many species did you actually grow I think that first year we maybe grew like a dozen different species out, but then it was supplemented with plugs that um, we got. Yeah. From so they grew some, some of the easy ones, which you can figure out thanks to Prairie Moon handy uh, keys, um, which ones need stratification, which ones you can plant more just like a vegetable seed. Uh, and then we supplemented those species with ones that we bought to make the planting a little more diverse. Still, I think it's hard to achieve as much diversity in a plug planting as you can achieve in a, in a seed planting. Although one, one, I guess, counter argument is that when you're doing a plug planting, you have a lot of control and you're really gonna realize the diversity that you plant. A lot of times you throw out these diverse seed mixes and don't necessarily see all the species show up um, or it can just take a lot of time for them to show up. Um, yeah, I guess pros and cons to both, both methods, but we're, we're all happy to help you talk through what, what might be best for your individual situation. And I think another factor, of course, is going to be the area of the planting. If it's small, I would definitely recommend paying a little more and going with plugs. But if it's an acre, anything more than a quarter acre, um, you're, you're definitely going to be working with seed. Um, as far as the nesting question, so yeah, we haven't covered nesting at all yet, but about 70% of our native bees nest in the ground. Um, so these are things like your squash bees, mining bees, wet bees. About um, the remaining percentage, about 30% of our, of our native bees nest in cavities, and that can be dead wood um, or dead stems. And so what Joan was talking about with beetle, the beetle bank management was when you mow the habitat, rather than mowing it off to the ground and removing all of that plant um, matter, it can be really beneficial to mow higher. Um, or if you're out there with the hand pruners to prune higher at like six to 12 to 18 inches. Um, and in doing so, you're, you're essentially you're leaving stem stubble. And though that stubble 
ends up serving as nesting sites for those cavity nesting bees. And you're actually, by, by cutting the plant, you're creating an entrance that they can use to get in and build their nest. And you all can go out and do this this spring and then watch it. I mean, it's amazing how your cut ends get used and how easy it is to just see it happen. And they'll go from a flower, collect pollen, fly a few feet over, bring that pollen down in the nest, back out again. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. This is Shelly. I can share my story a little bit and I'll, should I put my video on? Yeah, up to you. Hi. Hi. So about nine years ago, I bought my 20 acre farm um, west of the Twin Cities. And I had the tillable field um, turned into prairie and I had prairie restorations do it. I was just beginning. So I just, I got some good advice from Nick Olson because I, I used to be in farm beginnings. Yeah. His advice was never plant your own field when you're a beginning farmer. And it, <laughs> And so I thought, well, I'll have someone else plant my prairie. So Prairie Restorations did it. And they did a really good job. They seeded it um, right in the middle of the summer. And it was scary the first year because of all the, the weeds. They, but they said, no, it's going to be fine. And it really was. It's, it's wonderful. Um, but one thing, I, I've heard all the three podcasts. And one thing I learned was, and I was wondering this, is that have flowers too close to a, your neighbor conventional farmer because if the spray gets on the flowers and then that's kind of been bothering me for a few years trying to understand that and then so I heard it for the first time so I appreciate hearing that because that clicked but prairie restoration I have a quarter mile border between me and my corn soybean neighbor and it's equal there was no change in the seeding be between so the flowers are constant everywhere so this is something to think about. I don't know how I remove the flowers or if I try and add in the coniferous uh, edge to try and block a little. I don't have any organic crops to protect um, because it's all prairie. My farm is 100% native. I haven't added any farm into it yet. Um, <laughs> so that's where I am. That's something to think about. Like, what would the coniferous border be? Um, maybe not eastern red cedar. <laughs> <laughs> well, for one thing, I'm so glad you brought that up because it uh, it's a ubiquitous problem throughout agricultural areas. Um, and I also am kind of annoyed that you feel like you have to be the one to, um, I mean, this is, the burden of all organic producers that they're the ones who have to manage um, to protect, you know. Yeah. <laughs> the first thing I want to do is instead of you taking out flowers is consider the idea that maybe your neighbor might adapt some changes to that border on their side. <laughs> Although I, I know the likelihood <laughs> of that happening. Um, so yeah, coniferous um, hedge kind of could be a possibility. Sometimes in, you said you're west of the Twin Cities, and that starts to be in the prairie zone. Um, sometimes, depending on your landscape context, we opt to not put in trees, um, and we would recommend more of just a grass buffer so that you're not, you're at least not bringing in um, insects to contaminated flowers. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, unfortunately, there aren't a lot of native conifers for that part of the area. So pretty much anything that one of your local SWCD tree sales would offer, like spruces or um, even like arborvitae, they're not native there, but they do, if you put them in, they would protect your habitat from pesticides. Okay. Um, yeah, any other thoughts from you guys? I, I have a question. So on the cost share for installing a pollinator habitat, is that something that is also cost shared on it if you do need to put up um, conifers or, you know, some sort of a buffer there between you and a conventional corn or soybean field? I think you could look at cost share funding for something like a windbreak. You know, you might not call it a, a risk protection buffer, but there are things that should be able to do the job and, and fit under NRCS practices. 
it is a lot harder to, uh, I, I empathize with you, Shelley, because it's really hard to take out existing habitat. And a lot of the farmers that we're working with in Iowa, their farms are so tied up against conventional and probably in your situation too, um, that often the really the only place they have for habitat are these, these drift cone areas. And sometimes their entire farm is really drift um, susceptible. Um, so I'm, I guess I think about it or maybe put a little bit more thought into this issue in terms of habitat planning when you really are in that opportunity where you're starting from scratch and trying to look for places on your farm that are the most protected, um, most protected. But yeah, I think I think the coniferous buffer or or like like carrothead grass buffer is probably probably your best bet. Okay, that's. Do you have a number for Shelly, like distance, like length? The length of my border. Oh, as far as what buffers should be. Um, we have a couple of documents. Okay, so I'll just hold these up and we can post them in the, in the chat. But this one is guidance to protect habitat from pesticide contamination. It's more of a tech, technical tech note. Um, and it has recommended buffer distances in there for different situations. So it depends, the buffer di distance depends on the types of chemicals that you're trying to protect against. Um, we also have one, I don't know if I have it handy, but we have another one that's a little bit more farmer friendly. Um, it has a lot of examples of ways farmers have approached this issue. Um, you know, protecting their own habitat from their own crops, if they're conventional or from neighboring crop, crop land. You can put that in the chat as well. I was in a talk once about um, the prairie, prairie strips program. Um, and I just saw these pictures of like conventional corn and then the, like prairie strips going through it of um, which pollinator habitat, which I think had flowering species. And I said like, I asked them, you know, is, is this going to be a problem with drift? And they were like, well, you know, this prayer can be like right next to the ground and stuff. And I was just like, uh, this, this is going to be a problem, isn't it? And so do you have any insight into the, uh, like prairie strips program in particular? And, and if they're aware of, of that or thoughtful about that at all? I'm gonna punt that to you, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. This is hard because, I mean, I think what they would say is that, sure, there's this insecticide exposure risk, um, but there's also a very real risk of pollinators starving in that landscape. So, you know, pick your poison kind of thing. Potentially starve your pollinators, potentially poison your, your pollinators. Um, we at Xerces are more conservative about that. We really do try hard to place habitat away from conventional um, conventional crop fields, particularly fields with with neonics being used um, in the in the seed treatments, which moves to the soil. And we know from many 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 research studies that those chemicals can be uptaken into adjacent plants at levels that are problematic for, for pollinators. So again, I would just say on your own farm, do your best to find your most protected spaces to plant your habitat. And like Karen said, try to have those hard conversations with adjacent farmers if you can, because um, sometimes people might be more receptive than you'd think to uh, taking, like I've had farmers, conventional farmers who have taken some of their corn and soy out of, out of that crop and put it into hay in order to protect their adjacent wildflower planting, because um, they can still make a little bit money, a little bit of money on the hay, and um, have something that's safer. So, sorry, not the not not really maybe what you're going for, but it's it's a nuanced issue for sure. Something we talk a lot about at Xerces. Yeah, and it that reminds me of the saying of too that to yeah, it reminds me of the saying to to not let the perfect get in the way of the good. You know that just because you can't hit all of these points and that there may be some downsides or some negative effects that, you know, we really are at the point in our environmental reality where, you know, we're, we're, we're reaching tipping points um, and that every little bit of habitat matters at this point. And if it's not perfect, it's still 
so much better than nothing. <laughs> um, so I would just I would just encourage folks to not get. It is de absolutely something to consider, and like Sarah and and Karen were saying, that you always want to consider the most protected areas. But you know, depending on what the reality of your farm layout looks like, you know, there might there might not be that um, ideal optimal place for habitat, but. But if there was no habitat there prior before, you know, we're still we're still moving in the right direction.